Um, but I'm also really glad for this opportunity to talk to you today. And I have to admit that um, when I first gave my title to Affymetrics, it was just really broad. And then I saw who else was speaking and I thought, oh, um, I wish I hadn't known that just because they're going to do such a great job. But then they said, I'm first. So I thought, okay, that's fine. I don't have to follow them. Because, so <laughs> uh, yeah, it'd be hard to follow those speakers. And then I also thought, well, what can I add to what they're already going to say? Because there's a lot of cool cases that I'm sure they're going to show you. And so as I thought about, well, what can I offer? I thought, well, let me do this a little bit more as a workshop, a little bit more as a, you know, let you into my brain as I look at these cases and how I think about them. So it's going to be um, showing you some cool cases, but also showing you how do I use the tools within the software? How do I think about these cases in order to do a, um, a hopefully a reasonable job interpreting them? And then maybe that can help you as you're looking at this platform on oncology samples, particularly hematologic. <clears throat> so again, these were some of the thoughts that I had running through. We have a, a really um, good constitutional volume, but I think one of the concerns in oncology has been, well, what's going to be the volume? You know, we know that this is now a first-tier technology for developmental delay, but what will be its um, role in cancer? We can see through a lot of papers that it really does increase the detection rate, it finds a lot of cool things, but if we put it on our menu, will we have a robust volume? And so I thought, well, <clears throat> if I have a platform that really can be used, used for multiple indications, then this will really help with this concern because I use the same platform, Cytoscan, whether it's a developmental delay or a POC or an ALL. It's the same platform. So my technologists have become really proficient with this platform because for them it's DNA that's going through an assay. So it can be um, from a bunch of different types of sources for the DNA and with mo multiple indications. And then when it comes to me, that's when I say, okay, the indication is such, so here's how I think about it when I go through the analysis. And it can be a little different for the indication and the different sample types. But for my technologists, um, they're going to still be able to batch those cases. Inventory management still going to be um, reasonable to do. Turnaround time is going to be reasonable to do because we're going to have these batches. Um, so that was one thing that I thought was a, an important consideration. Plus, cancer is mosaic, so I really wanted to make sure that I have a platform that has really good mosaicism detection capability. And of course, constitutional can be mosaic as well, so it runs in both areas. But I'm going to kind of come back to that idea about how do we maximize this tool for the mosaicism detection, because that's particularly important in cancer. And then, <clears throat> it's not going to be the test for all cancer samples. It's not going to be like constitutional, where we start to say, you know what, this is really the first tiered test. We already know that uh, it's going to be a very good adjunct technology, but there are going to be considerations. And I just want to put it out there so that we can, we can be done with it. We can recognize that it's a really good tool for copy number and acquired loss of heterozygosity. And it has good mosaicism detection capabilities. But there may be other things that we need to consider in cancer samples based upon indication and based upon the patients, you know, where they are within their treatment profile. So it's not going to, this platform is not meant to detect truly balanced translocation. So based upon the indication, you may need to look for very specific gene fusions. Um, mosaicism detection is not always going to be reliable under a certain level, and I wanted to emphasize that. You may hear people say, well, I detected this at 5% and I detected this at this percentage, but it's not, it's can you always detect it when it's 5%, or will you miss it sometimes when it's 5%? And I think that part of that is going to depend upon the quality of that particular array um, and that particular DNA, but also what's the size of the abnormality? How many megabases or kilobases is it? Is it a gain? Is it a loss? Those are also going to play into your detection. So because of all of these things, we're not going to think about this as a, maybe a great tool for minimal residual disease. It's not being promoted as such. And it also may miss some subclones, um, really small subclones. But so just recognize that. Um, it's not currently designed to detect specific nucleotide mutations. So I know Josh will talk about Oncoscan where that may be something that gets built into, well, it's built a little bit into Oncoscan, it may get built into future platforms with SNPs, but right now we're not looking at this as a replacement for single nucleotide mutations. Um, but there are many situations in which copy number and acquired loss of heterozygosity is informative, and um, so we can utilize it there and then supplement with other technologies as needed. I wanted to spend a little time going through this, and I apologize for the the users who are really comfortable with this, but I think for other users who are getting kind of used to what is an allele track, how do these SNPs work, it's so important when we look at cancer samples that I wanted to spend a little time just going over um, what the data is representing. So that when we show slides later, you'll be like, yep, I get that pattern, I get that pattern. So basically we have 
the SNPs are going to be for um, a biallelic situation. So you can be either AA, BB, or AB for any particular region where you have two chromosomes, where you're diploid. And then the way that it's plotted within the software is pretty much just an A minus B. So you give each allele a value of 0.5, and then you just plot it. So if you're AA, then you're going to be 0.5 plus 0.5 minus 0, because it's going to be your A's minus your B. And so for that particular uh, SNP, you would have a dot at the plotted at 1. And if you were AB, you would have A minus B would be 0. So for that particular SNP, you'd get a dot plotted at the 0 line. And then for BB, you'd get a dot plotted at the minus 1 line. And so if we have, you know, quite a few SNPs in a row, and you're kind of a mixture of heterozygous and homozygous throughout the chromosome, it'll end up looking like this. So this is our standard pattern for a normal diploid situation with AA, AB, and BB. And a lot of people think of this as AA, AB, and BB, but I want to make sure we actually remember that this is um, really A minus B. So this is when there's allelic balance, when you have just as many A's as you have B's, so that when you subtract A minus B, you get zero. So this is representing, to me, some people think of it as the heterozygous line. I think of it as the allelic balance line. Um, when we have a gain, we're going to lose that allelic balance, because we're going to gain either A or gain B. And if we do our A minus B, we'll see that we also have pushed out the tracks. So now we should have lines at 1.5 and minus 1.5, as well as uh, 0.5 and minus 0.5. And when we have a loss, we should go in. So we should have just a 0.5 and a minus 0.5. So here's a normal region and then going to a loss. And so these are heterozygous, you know, um, not mosaic gains and losses. What about if it's mosaic? Well, again, we can just do our A minus B. And so if I just think about it, okay, I've got 20% mosaicism. So for every five cells, one of them has a loss. And I just do my A minus B calculation. And what should happen is that I should have my outer tracks come in a bit. So instead of plotting at 1 and minus 1, they're plotting at now 0.9 and minus 0.9. And I should ha ha now have also an allelic imbalance, because I'm either losing A or losing B preferentially. So I should not have tracks at 0, but I should have them moving out now to 0.1 and minus 0.1. A duplication, again, the same kind of setup. But now my tracks, my outer tracks have moved out, and my inner tracks are still at that same 0.1 and minus 0.1. So again, I should still see an opening kind of here in that middle portion of, I think of it as the hamburger. So my meat's gotten a little bit more spread out, and my bun's gotten bigger. What about copy neutral absence of heterozygosity? And this is what I'm, I'm trying to use the word absence of heterozygosity because it's not implying any kind of mechanism. It's just there's a region and there's no, um, heterozygosity there. So this is a region where we see only AA and BB patterns. So um, there is nothing here in the A minus B. I mean, sorry, nothing here in the uh, indicating heterozygosity. And when it's mosaic, I just want you to focus. This is a kind of a cool case, and let's ignore this deletion here. That could be a whole other conversation. But just focus in right here of this is the pattern for mosaic absence of heterozygosity, and I can even in this case call it loss of heterozygosity because I know that I previously had some heterozygosity. Um, and so we see that we still have the outer tracks at one and minus one, and then we're having this inner track open up. So that's a little bit different than a deletion or a duplication where the outer tracks move in and out. Here my outer tracks are staying solid, but my inner tracks are moving out because of my mosaic loss of heterozygosity. Okay, another uh, feature of the software that I find very useful for when I'm looking at the patterns and thinking about what it means is the smooth signal. And so if you have a normal region, then your smooth signal is just really sort of an, a rolling average of your log two ratio. And so it should be coming in for a diploid chromosome right around two. And there will be some noise around it, just because there will be some noise within your uh, copy number probe performance. Um, 
and this default settings on the software are between 0 and 5. And I'm also going to come back to the idea of maybe changing some of the default settings, but this is what it would look like kind of in a nice normal situation. If you have a mosaic loss, then it shouldn't drop down to a copy number state of 1, it should drop down though below 2. And so, as you can see, here's a region, in fact, this is a um, this is a region that's relatively gained, and this is a region that's relatively lost. And then here's an example of the smooth signal when it's gained. Here's the, the two, the copy number two, and you can see that it's actually up here more around kind of a 2.7. And we've done um, work looking at how does this correlate with fish, and it does do a pretty good job um, correlating with a fish identified percent mosaicism. So we would expect that if we were to fish this abnormality, it should also come in around the 70% gain. How does it, you know, the kind of zooming out and now putting the smooth signal in with like a whole, the whole context. So here I have the log two ratio. You can see that this is 12P. It's elevated um, on the P arm, not on the Q arm. My allele tracks are separating as I expect. It's mosaic in that I'm not getting I'm not getting these at 0.5 and minus 0.5, but they are opening up from the middle. And my smooth signal is also confirming that this is a mosaic call. It's coming in at around 2.4. So this is 40% more um, cells. In fact, this is, just if you're wondering, this is a, an ISO 12P in about 20% of cells. So the 40% gain is due to the um, isochromosome giving, each time you have the isochromosome giving two extra copies of the PR. Here's a loss, and again, so you can see this is chromosome 18. You've got a, a log two ratio that then drops down. Your smooth signal comes in, and it's not coming into just um, 0.5 and minus 0.5. It's coming in like it should for a mosaic, and your smooth signal is confirming that it's mosaic. It's coming into about 1.6, so it's about a 40% loss. I also just threw this slide in. We did a, a number of reproducibility studies with complex samples just to see how reproducible this, these patterns were if we ran them again and again within runs. And again, you can see that although there's a lot of complex changes going on on this chromosome 6, the, um, the SNP performance with the allele pattern is very reproducible, the smooth signal is very reproducible, and, this is, and the smooth signal is just essentially representing the log 2 ratio. All right, so now that you feel comfortable with what these patterns, how, how to look at these patterns and think about them, how can they be applied to cases? So I'm going to show a number of cases and just how they help. This was a sample that came, um, it was first, the fish was done by another group. Um, we had those results, and it's 45 year old with ALL. The chromosomes weren't done, but they had done a kind of a panel of probes for ALL, and it had been interpreted as because of the gain that you saw of MYC and BCR and MLL and IGH and TCF3 as hyperdiploidy. We were a little worried though, because there's a lot of fours in that grouping, even though there is a three in that grouping. Um, so when we did an array on this case, it helped because it, um, actually I should go back to, and oh, da, da, too far. These are kind of low percentages. So we're talking about 15%, maybe 20% of cells with that pattern. So you also might be worried, is my array going to be informative to help me look at a pattern that's at that lower level? And I'm gonna argue that yeah, it is, especially when you're talking some whole chromosomes because there's lots of data points on a chromosome. So chromosomes that had four copies by fish in the abnormal population had allelic balance. So you can see there in that SNP track that we're getting our A minus B equals zero. So if I've got four copies, but A minus B equals zero, it means I have two copies of each homolog. So I have gained each homolog, not just one homolog twice. And then chromosomes that had two copies by fish showed mosaic LOH. So my outer plots are still at one and minus one, but my inner plot is opening up. And again, at a level that would be consistent with about that 20%. So this is showing that What's happening in 20% of the cells is that one homolog is being lost and the other homolog is being gained. So what is this? It's severe hypodiploidy with a doubling of the hypodiploid clone in 20% of the cells. 
And so the allele pattern was really helpful with feeling comfortable with that. Rather than just questioning their fish, we felt very comfortable now with this conclusion, and it changes the prognosis. Some other cases that I just wanted to show you because they, um, they can be almost cautionary is uh, sometimes you have a big abnormality and you just are so satisfied to see it that you forget to be like careful and look within. So this was a case that by cytogenetics was 45X minus X in 90% of cells. It was a three-year-old female. We called and asked if there was any concern for Turner syndrome. There was not. So we, we thought this um, maybe wasn't ruled out as a constitutional abnormality, but could also be associated with the hematologic clone. We did an array. We saw the loss of X. We thought, okay, we see the loss of X. That's good, because our chromosomes told us we should. Um, but it took a careful eye within the lab to notice an, an, another concerning thing, which is that within the PAR, there was a mosaic biallelic deletion. So we have a loss of one entire X, and then within the remaining X, there's a mosaic deletion. And we have um, bed files that we load up into the CHAS software that we can annotate within the CHAS software, and that can be really useful because it's the entire genome, and it's hard to keep track of everything you've read, everything you're trying to remember. But you can add these regions into a bed file, and then you can even um, right-click on them and add your own annotations. So I can see that we've annotated this region before. I can right-click on it and remind myself, oh yeah, I want to look for an adjacent deletion between this gene and this gene, or deletion between these genes, and here's my reference for that particular alteration. So here's that particular reference. That deletion is resulting um, in a fusion of these two genes that are flanking that deletion. So in, this is also an example of where the deletion in and of itself is not what I'm worried about. It's that the deletion has resulted in a fusion. So it's, it's an interesting case for multiple things. One, we almost missed it because it was a little thing inside of a bigger thing. Two, um, the annotations help. Remind yourself why you worry. Three, the deletion itself is not what we worry about. It's the fusion that it creates. So don't just look at the genes within your CNV. Look at the genes flanking your CNV. So I could throw out another example like PDGFR alpha and FIP1L1. That was one where you don't care that there's a CHIC2 deletion, you care about the fusion that was created. And then of course we see this again and again that in oncology, sometimes we do have truly balanced translocations and other times they're not truly balanced. And so again, looking at the flanking regions of your CNVs can help. So this is an example of a translocation 922 with a gain of the Philadelphia chromosome and a deletion of the ASS region. We know that these both occur um, in a subset of cases with the 922, and this is what it looked like on an array. So here's the deletion of the ASS region, upstream of ABL. Here's a gain that occurs right inside ABL. And of course, we expect if we look on the 22 that we should have a gain of proximal 22 with a breakpoint right inside BCR. So this is, um, this was fish confirmed. It was actually in a low percentage by fish. And um, also on metaphases, it was found in just one metaphase had an additional copy of the derivative 22. You also might be noticing, because that we kind of suspected because of our we already had the fish results. So we, we knew that there would be a low level gain of the Philadelphia and that we would have a deletion of ASS. What we didn't expect when we were looking at the array profile was over here. So now you're, you're getting used to this. And you look at that, and you should say, Oh, look, your smooth signal is way below 2, so I've got it as a, not a line now, it's a, um, a bar, so it might be a little throwing you off. But anyways, you can see that there's a deletion of 9P, and we didn't expect that. So going to the next slide, I'm just showing you the chromosomes. So this was the major population where we had a 922 translocation, and then this was found in only one cell, but we did have that extra copy of that derivative 22. But in both of these cells, we have perfectly good, as far as I can tell, 9Ps. So why did I have a whole arm 9P deletion by array? Also, I wanted to point out that most cells had 220s, but this subclone only had 120. But then this was only one cell, so that might have been just a, an artifactual loss. Well, um, seeing 9P gone, looking around at the rest of the uh, array, it started to make sense because 20 is a kind of a mess. So what we see is that we have a gain of 20p um, and a little bit after the centromere, and then a loss of 20q. 
So, and it's not a big loss, it's a mosaic loss, but what we have is the dicentric 920. So what I see up here that I think is 9p is really 20p. So. Also, again, this kind of goes back to that first example that I had where you had a, an abnormality within an abnormality. So focus on those subtle pattern changes. I think we're mostly cytogeneticists, we like patterns. So, you know, you get to stay with it. You get to continue to focus on subtle pattern changes. So this is a case that at first blush just might look like a trisomy 8. So you've got your smooth signal and it's hovering up here, maybe about 2.3, so maybe about a 30% trisomy 8. But there's obviously something changing right here. And don't ignore that. Don't just think, oh, mm -hmm. These were the chromosomes in that case. So the chromosomes had what looked like at maybe first blush might just be trisomy 8, but I see a few like scouring faces thinking the bottom of that 8 is a bit fluffy, isn't it? So anyways, <laughs> and then here's my 22s. And again, you might be going, hmm, bottom of one of those 22s is a little, kind of got a little dark there maybe. Anyways, what we really have is if you focus in on this transition point right there, you see the MIC gene. So we've got the MIC gene right at a transition point of an allele pattern change and a copy number change. And then we also have the IgK locus here on 22. And again, if you appreciate it, there's a copy number change, a very subtle one, right there at that breakpoint and an allele pattern change right there at that breakpoint and also a deletion right there. So what we really have is two derivative 8s from a translocation 822. So it's not completely balanced. And there were only two metaphases that had this particular finding. It was low level, but it made us feel much more confident that this wasn't just a trisomy 8. This was a, a MIC IgK fusion. Uh, here's just another example of how even at low levels you can start to uh, look at the genes around a copy number change to identify breakpoints. So uh, we had this particular karyotype in only two metaphases. This is a BALL. Um, looking at this, at first we thought, well, that is just the funniest thing sitting on top of that 13, but it sure looks a lot like this derivative 14. So we ended up concluding that this was likely a, an extra copy of the derivative 14 sitting on that 13. So we had two copies of a derivative 14 and wondered if perhaps there was an IGH rearrangement because of the breakpoint on that derivative 14. And also wondered if perhaps it was um, translocating with 17, because 17 is obviously missing something on bottom. Um, so we did IGH fish break apart, and it was positive for an IGH rearrangement, but there's no known partner at that point on 17Q that, that we could see in the atlas for an IGH rearrangement. But we also could tell that this is likely unbalanced because we have two copies of the derivative 14. So even though it's only in two metaphases, perhaps the array will tell us who's the partner on 17 because it's an unbalanced translocation now. So here's the, the IGH fish just to prove that we did have a break apart of IGH and we had two copies of the red probe for um, the break apart region. So it is confirming that it's an unbalanced translocation. It is only in about 15% of cells. But when we look at the array and we go in on 17 and we say, where do we have that shift in the copy number pattern and in very subtle shift in the allele pattern, right there is this gene IGF2BP1. Uh, well, who are you? <laughs> well, there's a paper a few years ago that had this translocation, but they didn't identify the breakpoint partner. And then there's this other paper that was just doing expression um, profiling in distinct BALL entities and found that high expression of this gene was a characteristic feature of ETB6 rugs one B cell ALL. So we looked at that and thought, well, fusing a gene with IGH is a sure a good way to get it to overexpress. So another uh, situation in which I think a copy number change could be an indicator of a translocation, but not always, would be an ETV6 deletion. So we know ETV6 deletions occur in lots of B cell ALL often in association with the translocation 1221, but not, but not exclusively. So I think if you're looking at a pediatric BALL, you should be doing the fish for ETV6 frogs one. You, you should be, but let's say you're not. But you have an ETV6 deletion, now I think you really should be. But it still may not be positive. So we just did a very small series at the time that I made this slide, and we just had seven cases that showed ETV6 deletion on array. Um, 
we did ETV6 break apart fish and also um, the 1221. And we, five of them were really unbalanced translocations that involved an ETV6 rearrangement. Four of them partnered with Ronx1. Two of them did not, uh, were not associated with ETV6 translocations. But that's just another example of thinking about when your copy number changes could be indicative of rearrangements. All right, slightly changing themes now and talking about um, ways in which I try to maximize the possibility of detecting mosaicism. And I, I wanted to say too that I don't feel like we always, that we rule out mosaicism. I think what we do is we maximize our ability to detect it. Um, so if you have a mosaic C and V under 20%, I don't think that it's always going to get flagged by your software, by, for sure. Maybe it'll be a little bit better in CHAS 2.0 because it's a little bit more designed for putting mosaic calls in the segment report. But here's a case that does have trisomy 7. And you can see that the copy number segment report is just has a few little blue triangles, but for the most part is not recognizing it. Um, the SNP pattern, it's also hard to really see in the SNP pattern. This is getting a little thicker, but it's really not separating out. But my smooth signal is clearly elevated. And here's what I've done. Remember the default settings were 0 to 5. I've scrunched it down to be between 1.5 and 2.5. So I'm really now focusing in on that smooth signal and exaggerating it so that I can more easily see when the moving average across the log 2 ratio is really above 2 on a regular basis. And then that should be my suggestion rather than just relying on the segment report. And I think that in cancer you really do have to you know, look at the data, don't just rely on the segment report and look for these patterns. Here's another example of where again, nothing on my segment report was called but looking at the data and really scrunching in on that smooth signal, I can see that proximal 21 up to about this point is elevated above two. And yeah, you're thinking there's some noise in there, but there will be some noisier samples. So yeah, I think you need to spend a lot of time looking at the data and getting comfortable with that is elevated. And it stops right there. And what's right there? Runx one. So what do I worry about? I worry about that there is an unbalanced translocation involving Runx one. And then fish showed that there was a translocation 1221 and 5% had an extra copy of the derivative 21. So it was a really low percentage by fish. Um, smaller than that, I may, not, I may have missed, because again, you can appreciate there's noise. But this is a good chunk of this chromosome. So I guess what I'm saying is that the larger your aberration, the more data points you have to look at, and the more you can appreciate when there's a change from the norm. But I wouldn't say that, oh, I pick up 5% mosaicism. Because a smaller aberration, there may not have been enough data points for me to detect it. But I just want to try to have you think of ways you can maximize your ability to detect it when it is there. Another tool that I think can be useful to help you maximize that potential is this chromosome summary data tab. It's the third tab in the CHAS software. So you have your display, you have your QC, and then this, there's this tab. And you can change these settings, but one of the settings that I like is the median copy number state. And I like to load up a number of cases and get used to what is kind of the, the um, normal median copy number state for a chromosome. And I've actually got a bunch of cancer cases loaded up here, so not all of these are normal. But, um, but as I've loaded up a bunch of them, I'm noticing two cases here that have a lower median copy number state for chromosome 20 than the other cases in that run. So you can see it's coming in, most of them are right around 2.0, but this one's coming in at 1.96 and 1.97. That's probably not a whole chromosome issue with 20, that, but it could be a good chunk of 20 that has a loss. So that can also be another flag for you to go back and look more carefully at that chromosome. And so in this case, going back and looking more carefully, the probes here for 20p are all low whereas 20Q is fine, so it looks like a 20P deletion. And in this case, it looks like a 20Q deletion, not a whole arm, just in this region of 20Q. And because we have a fish probe to this region, we were able to go back on this case and fish confirmed that, and fish confirmed it out to about 7.5%.
But I wanted to go back to this and just say, you know, do this with a lot of cases to kind of get a sense of the normal range. Um, just kind of like you do with fish, you try to figure out what's your lower level cutoff by looking at a lot of normal cases. And also a warning, in hyperdiploids, so I've got a case here, let me grab, this one right here is a hyperdiploid case. And so when you have a hyperdiploid case, the normalization process can kind of lower the copy number state of all of the chromosomes. Because if you think about it, you're adding the same amount of DNA, but you're adding less cells because each cell has more DNA because it's a hyperdiploid. So because of that, your copy number across all your chromosomes will be a little bit reduced. So I did want to add this additional warning that when you have a hyperdiploid case, almost every chromosome gets knocked down a little bit. Um, so that's why in this one I'm seeing a lot of ones coming in more at 1.97, 1.9 somethings. All right. I wanted to also uh, encourage users that are still using um, 6.0 to really consider moving to Cytoscan. I know it's a big deal to, to validate new platforms and it's a new protocol, but the data is really improved. And so I just wanted to point out some cases. So here's the same case run on 6.0 in Cytoscan. In both cases, you are seeing a loss and you are seeing the allele pattern suggestive of a loss, your smooth signal suggestive of a loss, but isn't it so much easier to see it? when your data is cleaner. So, and that's a 90% loss, so nobody should be missing that. But when you have lower levels of losses, that clean data is even more important. So here's about a 15 to 20% loss on 6.0 versus Cytoscan. And so much easier to see that middle track opening up because of that allelic imbalance due to the loss than with the previous performance of the SNPs. Both of them still have smooth signals hovering below too, but less noise as well. And it's also true on the gains. So here's a gain at a high level. Again, you get the four tracks as you would expect and the elevation on the smooth signal, but much cleaner, much easier to feel confident in on Cytoscan. And also important for low level gains. Hard to see the, the track opening up in the middle, easy to see the track opening up in the middle, cleaner. Um, I wanted to also mention that if you're using Cytoscan for constitutional, you've come used to having three QC metrics that you regularly look at, and there's some assumptions behind those, and you may need to uh, think about how they play out in cancer. So one of them is the MAPD, and that's basically just asking about neighboring probes and are they e expected to have about the same copy number state, and it allows for transition points for real copy number changes, but it's basically just doing kind of a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor evaluation of noise. Whereas waviness is kind of looking at a longer span that may not be represented in neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor analysis, but if you look at a longer span, you start to see that there is more variation from probe to probe, for, or from segment to segment of probes. So I like this slide, um, I got it from Matthew. But it's just basically, if you have low MAPD and low waviness, everything should look pretty tight. You could have a low MAPD and high waviness where neighboring probes agree with each other, but over a longer segment, you see this pattern, and that gives you a higher risk of a false positive because you're higher risk of having this cluster called a gain and this cluster called the loss. But if you do that zoom out, you should recognize that that's a waviness and probably not a real call. If you have a high MAPD and low waviness, if you look over a longer span, there seems to be you know, neighboring probes are agreeing with each other, but not within uh, neighboring segments, but neighboring probes are not. So this would be a higher risk of a false negative. And so both of those metrics are end up important. Um, SNPQC is basically just saying, if I take my alleles, can I bend them into three patterns that I expect for a diploid? And if it does a good job bending into the three expected patterns, you'll get a good SNPQC score. Tumors, though, can be quite complex, and so it can challenge some of those algorithms. The MAPD should still be quite relevant, because you should still have neighboring probes act very consistently, except for the copy number boundaries. But you may have a situation in which you have a lot of copy number alterations. So across the segment, that could challenge the waviness a bit, although the waviness should still be pretty good, but you might be a little bit more relaxed in your waviness. Your SNP QC is probably the thing that's going to be most challenged, because cancer doesn't always decide to have three bins for alleles. It often doesn't, especially when there's lots of copy number changes in LOH. 
So this sample is going to fail SNPQC, no doubt about it. But it's not because it's a bad sample. It's because it fails to have a regular diploid behavior across most of the genome. So this is not one in which you're going to want to rerun this case because it failed SNPQC. You're going to want to look at your SNPQC and go, you know what, I'm getting very distinct patterns that are consistent with my copy number changes or consistent with an LOH that is reasonable. And, and then so you're going to be okay with that. Um, but I don't want you to like, just mean that you totally relax all your QC, look at your data and, see, and evaluate it. So here's a, another area in which this case passes the SNP QC metrics, but I'll come to it how it passes one of them just barely. Um, I have the ERG gene here, so I might be particularly interested in looking at it and I might be particularly worried about that the software has flagged a deletion here that would hit this exon, but I think it's important, particularly for small call or for breakpoint, to look at both the weighted log two and the, the normal log two, the not weighted log two ratio. Because if it's a real call, they should both agree. And when I look at it, when I look at the not weighted, it is just not nearly as convincing. And then I think it's also, even though my smooth signal, because my smooth signal is averaging my weighted. So if I look at my not weighted, I'll get more of an idea of the data itself and if it's still consistent. And then I think it's also important to zoom out and get an idea of the context of that call. So when I zoom out, I can see that this is actually a pretty wavy sample. And so as I mentioned, when you have wavier data, you're more likely to get false positive small calls. So don't just hit your little, here's your red box, look at it. Zoom out, ask about how is this data looking overall. When you do that, you'd be like, oh, I am not so convinced. And my waviness barely passed the, the QC metrics of needing to be less than 0.12, it's 0.1194. So that would have also been a clue that I should be extra cautious about small calls. Here's an example of another reason why you might have a SNP QC failure, particularly in oncology. Your patient might have a history of a bone marrow transplant that they forgot to tell you about because you're, you know, we all know how good our requisition forms are <laughs> or how well they're filled out. Anyway, so this is a patient that we have, it's the same patient, 1%, at, sorry, at one time they had um, estimated 50% chimerism, Basically, they had a sex donor mismatch, so we were able to use XY dosing to get an, uh, an estimation of chimerism. So here they have about 50% chimerism, here they have about 20% chimerism. When you have um, chimerism, it's going to also uh, fail one of the assumptions of the SNPQC algorithm. So maybe you could say, oh look, my SNPQC is horrible, it's supposed to be better, uh, greater than 15 and it's 3.5 and 7.7, .7. but my MAPD and my waviness is actually pretty good. That might be one indication that you want to call and ask, because this patient had a bone marrow transplant. Um, or you might be really comfortable with this pattern being chimerism, but this pattern I found a little bit more challenging to be sure it's chimerism. But anyways, I just wanted to go, what does chimerism do? Just going back to our A minus B, throwing in another genotype. So if you have 50% chimerism, you should get five tracks. And when we had 50% chimerism, we did. But when you have only 20% chimerism, it starts to, cl to cluster back into three tracks again. And so it can look a little hard to see especially if you've had some cases that just kind of have bad data. So I'm just comparing a case with 20% chimerism with another case where we just had bad quality DNA. Um, when we re-extracted the DNA and ran it, we got good quality. So I think it's important to kind of get used to when should you redo the array? When is there a good biological explanation? If that makes sense. And you can use your other QC metrics to sort of help. And this one with a bad array, I also had high MAPD and higher waviness. One other thing we've sort of noticed as we've gone through is that, and I think we all know this, the software needs to be validated as well as the array. Because different softwares can apply different algorithms to your data and show you different things, have different filters. So if you think, well, I'm just going to take my AFI data and I'm so used to looking at it in Chaz, but I'm going to just throw it into Nexus without really understanding the algorithms that Nexus might use or the way that Nexus displays things, you're, you're running with scissors, I think. Anyway, so it's a little bit important to also make sure you really understand your different softwares if you're using different softwares. So, for example, if you load a cell file into Nexus, there are probes on Cytoscan that have been silenced 
but not in Nexus. So they're probes that get silenced when you take the file from a, CYC, from a cell to a CYCHP in CHAZ. But they're not silenced if you just load the cell file directly into Nexus. So here's a region where you know, we loaded this cell file and I saw this and I was like, wow, that's pretty noisy. It's calling a deletion, but it's really noisy. And I don't remember seeing that. It's not there in CHAZ because these probes are noisy. They sit on top of a segmental duplication rich region. They don't behave well, so they got silenced um, in CHAZ, but they didn't get silenced in Nexus because Nexus had a different algorithm. So anyways, that's just one example of how you need to, to understand when you're using different softwares what they, their differences. This is another um, area where I would change default settings. So the smooth joining uh, segments, you can change it up here under preferences and uh, edit user configuration. Um, but what it's doing is the default setting says if I have a call and it's not contiguous, um, I'll just convert the whole call to the most common copy number state within the run. So, um, and you could see how, in, in, you know, your eye might go ahead and agree with that, but you want to be careful. So here's an example of the software with the smooth setting turns on just calls this a one copy loss. But your eye would say, that's not a one copy loss, that's a one copy loss here and a biallelic loss there and it's a biallel class over CDKN2A, which is a common thing in, non in ALL. So if you turn your smooth off, and I just keep it off, it does make the call of a one copy loss and a two copy loss. So I would suggest turning the smoothing off. You're gonna get some calls that you'll think, you know what, that really is just one contiguous call. And that's go ahead, then go ahead and in your report override the software, but at least um, don't let the software guide you. I don't know. I guess the way I'm thinking about it is um, I like to look at the data itself, not just look at the red boxes or the blue boxes. And sometimes the red boxes or the blue boxes have algorithms behind them that make assumptions that you as a cytogeneticist and understanding oncology would not make. So joining is another one where it can take two independent calls and join them if there are a certain size or a certain markers. Um, and it, you might like that, it, let's say that you're looking at velocardiofacial deletion and it's the larger one. And you don't want it to come out as two independent deletions just because there's a seg dupe in the middle of it. You'd like it to come out as one deletion because that's how you're gonna put it in your report. So your joining would make that one deletion because it's just gonna call it across the segmental duplication. Um, but the problem is, is that same joining could take two calls that are small and do really have a normal region in between and join them. So this is another area where I just think, understand what smoothing and joining is doing to your data when it makes calls and um, turn it off in my mind, but understand that that means that you're gonna have to look at more broken calls, but that's okay. You in your mind can decide to stitch them back together if it's biologically relevant to do so or keep them separate. This is my last topic, I promise. But other people talk about, okay, I like the idea of the LOH, but how will I distinguish it from constitutional LOH? How will I think about it? I just want to reassure you there's data, there's literature out there that really helps. So I'm just going to point out a couple papers that have really done a nice job of looking at large cohorts and really mapping what is the common acquired loss of heterozygosity pattern for certain hematological conditions. So if, you know, myeloproliferative neoplasms, you can see that loss of heterozygosity depicted in blue for this particular paper is a, happens a lot on 9P, not the whole chromosome, 9P. And in, for myeloproliferative neoplasms, it's usually um, because of a JAK2 mutation that's under selection. And it happens on chromosome 1P and 14Q. Um, and it's not as common, it does happen a little bit on 7Q, but it's not nearly as common for the other chromosomes. And it's big. It's not small little things that you might get like with a population substructure. Um, here's another paper that's just looking at this in MDS and AML. And again, it's the, co the acquired LOH, it's not random. It hits certain regions more than others, and it's usually big, and it's usually terminal to, to the mechanism. And I also liked this paper because they actually did a comparison where they did acquired loss of heterozygosity on this side and constitutional loss or absence of heterozygosity 
on this side. And again, you can get that idea that acquired loss of heterozygosity is usually large and terminal. Constitutional absence of heterozygosity is more often interstitial and small. And again, it has to do with the mechanisms for these two um, phenomenon. And also that um, usually the loss of heterozygosity that's acquired is selecting some type of mutated gene. So, and there's a growing number of papers that really outline what, what are the players that we're most worried about when we have acquired loss of heterozygosity of these regions for particular indications. And then here's just an example from ALL where we see mosaic loss of heterozygosity selecting a CDKN2 mutation, deletion. So the deletion happens and then loss of heterozygosity makes it biallelic. All right, that's my last slide. Any questions? Thank you.